there is something very special when believers of like heart and mind get together. It just creates uh, something very powerful. And we hope that you as the listener can pick up on that and be blessed by it as well, because we're so glad you've joined us today. All right, let's dive right in. Uh, Brian, why don't you begin with the first dream encounter that you had about living wheels within wheels? All right. Well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up right now, but I do I do want to say this this I know was an encounter because when when I was coming out of it, there was such emotion involved, um, and I believe some, the Lord showed me something new today about dreams and encounters regarding our spirit and soul, which I want to share. Maybe John already knew this, or maybe this will be helpful um, to us all. But uh, let me just get the exact date for us. Uh, but it was it was quite amazing. Um, this was on May 18th, 2024. And uh, I gave this uh, a title of High in the Sky, Seeing Wheels Within Wheels. So uh, I'm going to read it uh, firsthand, and I guess I'll give a little bit of insight or whatever I, I share, and I'll turn it over to you both. So the first recollection I have in this encounter is that I am suddenly high up in the sky, and I am looking um, at a scene that made me feel like I was hundreds and hundreds of feet in the air. Um, maybe not skydiving height, I'm guessing that's thousands, <laughs> but it definitely wasn't, you know, like uh, 20, 30, 40 feet. It was really high. And to be honest, I don't even know if I uh, knew if my body was there or if I had a body. I just knew I was looking and in the distance, far distance, I could see the land and it was just beautiful. I could see the, the sky in front of me. And I found that right in front of me was, and this was a little bit, uh, maybe it was concealed from me because I didn't have great detail, but it looked like there was somebody either on a horse that was with its legs in the air so no, uh, not like this but kind of like this either somebody who was on a horse maybe a motorcycle or maybe even the way you would imagine if you could ride a what do you call those uh those um those fish that look like horses seahorse <laughs> seahorse um, sea sea horse. Horse. yeah thank you thank you i'm dependent on the for everything here <laughs> i don't know what it was but it was like a person was on it and they were upright on it it was very hazy and they were in, there was one in front of me and then there was one in the foreground, uh, maybe a couple feet from it, kind of like to the side. So there was two beams, I will say. And then underneath them, not exactly underneath, but underneath and, and to the side of them, I found these spiritual, supernatural looking like wheels. And they, this is the closest uh, image that I could find. Uh, hopefully this, the camera will catch it okay. Uh, but you can almost imagine like, almost like an atom would look. Mm -hmm. Almost like, um, now if I had to describe it exactly, exactly the way that I saw it, imagine taking a, a perfect um, titanium ring, like a wedding ring, taking one like this and imagine there was another one that was 90 degrees in, in on the side. And then there was another one that was like at an angle and it, they were just twirling within one another. And it was just very, it was full of energy. And they, they seemed to be following, each one followed the beam that was there. So in an instant, I'm just high up in the sky. I see these two beams. They look almost like they're vertical. And I see these things that look like uh, energy. And I knew this was of God. And then all of a sudden, I, I looked, I took my focus off of these things in front of me. And I looked in the distance, maybe just to take in the scenery. And all of a sudden, this rush of like longing for, for it's almost like I was in a, in a heavenly realm. Because the way that I, it made me feel felt like I've been here before, or a part of me has been here before. And I'm here again for an instant. And I've missed it, you know. Some people might say, you know, homesick, like of heaven before we were here. So that's the feeling I got. And then I just came out of the experience. That was the, the first one. Wow. Wow. So, so you that had is, night that is awesome. Awesome. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. I'm sorry. You had this the night of 518? Uh, or you the morning. Up 518? The morning. Okay. Yes. The morning. Yeah. Go ahead, Diana. I just wanted to get the date right. Oh, gotcha. Um, this is amazing. And I would say... As you looked out at the scene, you mentioned it was uh, quite beautiful, which makes me think that it was a heavenly encounter. You were you weren't just high up in the sky; you were way up or, or wherever that is. You know, but you were in a heavenly place. Makes sense. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead, John. It feels pretty profound. Yeah. I I, I believe that, um, and this is what I think I learned today. Uh, I'm so fascinated by dreams versus encounters and whatnot. I'm always seeking the Lord in my mind. And I feel like through time, he's beginning to reveal things, confirm things. And some things, I feel like I may be the only one who has yet um, uh, thought of that, but then maybe not until I hear confirmation. But since our spirit technically never sleeps because we're, well, 
we are always um, with the Lord and because we are joined with him in that sense of the word, we are with him wherever we are. If we are in Christ and uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 tells us he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit. So the way that I've understood it is our human spirit is joined with the Holy Spirit. And so if he's already in the future, we're already there in a sense uh, because we're talking outside of time and space. <laughs> so I'm thinking whenever we have these emotions, we come out of dreams or have this, uh, we'll have a dream and we'll say, man, it felt so real. The way that I, it hit me today is like a part of our soul was invited to participate with what our spirit was experiencing. Many times we'll have dreams and we're like, I know I dreamt something, but I can't remember. Well, our spirit knows, but our mind, which is part of our soul, it has uh, maybe it was hidden for us, from us, as it says in Job 33. Um, but the, I always pay attention to the emotions in my dreams. And also, if I'm ever in a dream and, and I wonder to myself something, like I'm trying to rationalize, that kind of lets me know, okay, a part of my soul was present in the spirit. So that's how I begin to kind of discern encounters from dreams, mm -hmm. or at least the way I'm thinking of it. So I'm just kind of explaining how, my thoughts there. So uh, th yes, this feeling of, of longing for this place, and I didn't even know where it was, uh, tells me that a uh, part of me was there present in the spirit. So I, I always honor those encounters very much and really, really treasure them. So I don't know if that shines a light um, for anyone out there, but hopefully it, it helps them. What do you feel like the purpose of the encounter was? That's a good question. And it's interesting you're asking me because um, in December, December 1st, actually, I had an encounter where the Lord, I believe, initiated something he wanted me to begin to look into, which was um, godly meditation and ascension and learning how to step into his presence. And it was so new that I started to, to do, started to do research. I found a few sources that were uh, godly, but there aren't really many out there. And the Lord started teaching me about how even what the enemy is doing out there that he does through the occult, through new age and whatnot, it is evil because they're doing it apart from Christ. But the enemy cannot create anything. Um, he can only copy and thwart and twist what God already has. So the Lord started challenging me and saying, there's always a genuine to what the enemy is counterfeiting. If I can say it that way. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I, um, he started teaching me about meditation and whatnot. And so when I had this encounter and I saw these, these spinning disks of energy, the first thing I thought to myself was, that reminds me of what I've been learning about. And I haven't shared this openly. So <laughs> uh, about how God has, how mankind has seven seals to, to, to his being. And it's like, these are the doors and gates that Psalms 24 speaks of in one sense, where it says, lift up uh, your heads, O ye gates. Um, oh, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. And it's not like God come into me, but it's rather God, you live inside of me because Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. And Ecclesiastes says eternity is written in your hearts. And so perhaps we're always thinking, Lord, come, but rather he wants us to go inward. Be still and know that I am God. And it's like he wants to come alive and live through us. And so I believe it has it relates to these seals being open within us. Um, and I'll just pause right there. I don't know how, how far. Uh, you want me to share? I know this is going to be very, very new territory, uh, but these discs reminded me of what some would call energy circles, energy centers, um, and if I dare say this, other religions apart from Christ call them chakras. Ah, okay. And I had been seeking the Lord for weeks, asking him, what about this, Lord? I don't understand. And then I looked up the definition of chakra, and I'm thinking, Lord, I know Hinduism is wrong. I know that's not you. I said, but if, if you're showing me this, what's your version? What's your original version? And I looked at the definition and it says this, and I, and I hope people out there are not offended. <laughs> Spiritual things will always offend the religious, but this is the definition. Chakra means wheel hmm. and refers to energy points in your body. Hmm. They are thought to be spinning disks of energy that should stay open and aligned as they correspond to bundles of nerves major organs and areas of our energetic energetic body that affect our emotional and physical well-being. And it's interesting that the demonic, their version uh, talks about seven chakras. Well, we all know the Lord loves that number. Yeah. And so it, I just find that very, very interesting. So, and just to make it plain, because people will misread, I'm not saying you should do anything to deal with Hinduism or New Age no. or New Age. And I'm not saying that I'm doing that either. But what yeah. I am saying is you can't point to that and say that God doesn't have an original version. He yes. can't because he's the creator. Right. And we have to be willing to, to say, okay, God, help me here. And this is like a foundational mm -hmm. thing that God has been really, really emphasizing with me because many of us, why is it that the occult and new age, why do they have power? Why, why are witches levitating? 
why are some, and this mm-hmm. is probably African nations and, and stuff, why are they flying? Should, yeah. should they have, you know, how much more powerful should God in our life yes. be in the real Christian? So that's going to really, really uh, stretch some of you. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, seeing Diana here smile and, and nod because that, that, that helps me. At least with what I'm sharing, I'm just like, Lord, please don't let them run away. <laughs> but I'll stop we, there. That's yeah, we have mean. so many adventures in God awaiting us. When we let go of suspicion and just look at his face, know he won't lead us astray and ask him, there's a counterfeit I see here. What's your real? And he will show that to us. And we're going to have whole realms opened up to us of discovery and delight and uh, learning to know him more deeply because we are experiencing his realms that live inside of him. And he will invite us into them if we have faith and can approach him that way. Amen. So it's called not giving the enemy more credit for deceiving us than the Holy Spirit has to be the revealer of truth and of who God is. Hmm. Amen. Interesting. I would say... um, just as a little bit difference of um, thought is if you're feeling the need to explore these areas, be very, very careful because there's a lot of deception and new age stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's, there's even people that are by what we're hearing, practicing ascension and believing that the restoration of all things means that we can save the fallen and the Nephilim and that Satan is going to come back to Jesus. And we're all going to be one big happy family and, (laughs) So I'm hearing stories of people that are spending a lot of time in this state where they're in the second heaven, trying to witness to people that the Bible clearly says, not people, but beings that the Bible clearly says are unredeemable. Amen. And I think that that can be a massive distraction um, Mm. to that end. Um, I do think that there's a lot of things that we don't understand related to people always will, will tell me a vivid dream they had where it felt like they were there, but it was someplace that was a different time or someplace that was a different location. And I'm, and they're like, man, I just felt like I was there. And I'm like, well, what if you were? Like, first of all, does it change the meaning of the encounter? Number one, usually it doesn't. But then the second thing is, and this is like a matrix. It's almost like a line from the matrix. It's like, well, how would you know? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? Like if God decided to translate you out of time and space, I've had people describe historical events that were well before they were born, that they knew the weather. And so I went back and I looked up the weather and I'm like, they don't know the weather, but they nailed it. Like they got Mm. every detail of what they were describing, where they see a table with people at the table. And they're like, this person was there. This person was there. This person was there. And then we go and I find a picture. And even the picture they saw on the wall behind them Mm. was accurate. And it, it, it's interesting if you ever want to freak somebody out is when they're talking about a hypothetical dream and you show them a picture and you're like, you mean this? And that's, <laughs> it's exactly what they saw in their dream. Wow. We had that happen on live dreams about a week ago where somebody wow. said they were at an old hotel in Hollywood and I just heard the Biltmore. And it's one of my favorite old Hollywood hotels. And while they're talking, I pulled up pictures and they're like, oh my gosh, that is exactly where I was. And I'm Whoa. like, it wasn't like a hypothetical. Just gives me God bumps. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, there's such, this is, this really counters, you know, people are, I've heard people say, be careful of over-interpreting dreams. And I, I haven't reached <laughs> that level yet. We're about seven months into one dream where we've had dozens and dozens of people working on it. And we're not, I don't even know that we're halfway done. We got some big pieces. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing events geopolitically unfold as a roadmap with this dream. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I invite people to jump into the deep end of dreams and realize that it's not a eight foot pool or a 10 foot pool. It's like the, you know, the Laurentian abyss, like you can go miles <laughs> down. Like we've spent hours and hours and hours reading books and watching documentaries about one symbol in a dream just to gain an understanding because our premise is we believe that God is speaking. So if God wants to use Abraham Lincoln in a dream, then I need to understand who he was, what he did more than, oh, well, he was, you know, the great emancipator. Well, you know, yeah. and so once you go down yeah. and you find that out and to that end, um, did you look up wheels within wheels in scripture? Uh, no, I mean, I've read it in Ezekiel, uh, if that's what you're referring to. I did read Ezekiel's encounter, um, very, very little, <laughs> little there, but it, it was pretty amazing. And of course, people have drawn art and whatnot, but, um, but yes. And then, of course, John's experience in Revelation chapter four, where he also saw the wheels within the wheels oh. and they have eyes. 
<laughs> we get freaked out at something that's a little bit not off or a little off for our, and it's like, yeah. wow, heaven is um, maybe not what you're expecting. <laughs> I was going to uh, comment, John, yeah. on what you shared. That was really good. Um, and I, our safety guide is the word of God. We have got to know who God is in revealed in his written word. That's not everything about God, but that is a foundation of truth. That is, it's going to help us sift through bogus stuff that is out there because we know it's not going to line up with God's word. So who he's yeah. revealed to be in his written word. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's why if you're going to do something like if you're studying dreams, and, and, and of course you guys know this, is we we just, we looked up everything in scripture on dreams. We looked up every dream, every verse on dreams. We put together an ebook on it. We put together a Bible study on it. We, we give those away for free as our gift on dreamlifedecoded.com for anybody that, like me, is like, man, I really want to understand what scripture says. And as you go through that, and you know, we'll spend an hour on the sun, moon, 11 stars bowed down to him. We'll spend an hour unpacking that in the historical context. And I, I feel like when you do that, you can see historical precedents. And as you were speaking, Brian, I was immediately, I didn't see this as necessarily an encounter that needs to be interpreted like a dream would be where it's like, okay, well, what are the main symbols, the sky, the horses, the wheels, you know, and more as I just really felt led to look up. I think probably the premier verse on the wheels within wheels would be Ezekiel 10. And the headline of Ezekiel 10 is the vision of God's glory departing from the temple. Mm. And and I'm just going to read a little bit of this because it's it's striking to me how like your encounter this is. Um, this is in the Amplified. Then I looked and behold, in the expanse or firmament, there was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared something glorious and brilliant above them like a huge sapphire stone formed to resemble a throne. And the Lord spoke to the man, the seventh angel, clothed in linen, and said, go between the whirling wheels under the cherubim, Fill your hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And as he entered, um, and he entered as I watched. Now, I want to stop right there because obviously it's up in the sky somewhere. There's angelic beings that are there. Now, in this one, there's the voice of God, which is is fascinating. But then there's also these what what they call whirling wheels. Um, when you talked about where were the two beings um with the horses kind of vertical, like they were climbing up a, a steep mountain or something where were they in relation to the wheels within the wheels so if you were um if you were looking at the scene yourself the first being would have been right in front um if i had to estimate maybe 10 feet from me and a little bit closer the wheel would have been like to the left and a little bit below mm. so it almost seemed like that that wheel or that energy was following the being but as I watched the beans, they weren't moving. They were, they were, they were still. And, and it was, again, it, it was almost like, um, not like a vapor, but it was fuzzy. I, w I didn't see with clarity, these two beans. It just seemed almost, I guess, almost like a pillar type um, uh, shape. And even though, uh, but it was definitely not horizontal, more like a vertical shape. And I just got that sense. There are two beans on top of something or two people on top of a bean that was kind of vertical. So yeah, and the other um, the other thing was same thing on the other side. In the foreground was the other um, person on a, on a horse, perhaps, and the energy circle was again to the left, into the into and below it a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting because it says you know go between the whirling wheels under the cherubim. So it's interesting that it matches scripture. There's heavenly beings. There's the wheels within wheels underneath the cherubim, and they're up in the sky. Um. You know, I'm just going to read a little bit more if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. This is awesome. Verse three, now the, cherub, the, the cherubim were standing on the right side of the temple when the man entered and a cloud, the Shekinah glory of God, filled the inner courtyard. Then the glory and brilliance of the Lord moved upward from the cherubim to rest over the threshold of the temple. And the temple was filled with the cloud and the courtyard was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even as far as the outer courtyard, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. It came about when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the whirling wheels, from between the cherubim. The man stood, the man entered and stood beside a wheel. Then a cherub stretched out his hand from between the cherubim, 
to the fire that was between the four of them and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen who took it and departed. Beneath their wings, the cherubim seemed to have something in the form of a man's hands. When I looked and behold, there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside one cherub and another wheel beside each other cherub. And the appearance of the wheels was like a sparkling Tarshish stone or burl. As for their appearance, all four looked alike as if one wheel were within another wheel. When they moved, they were in any of their four directions without turning as they went. But they followed in the direction which they faced without turning as they went. Their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes all around, even though when, even the wheels belonging to the four of them. So yeah, and it continues on with the various faces. Um, when the cherub stood still, the wheels would stand still. So it seems like there's a relation between the wheels and the, the beings, mm -hmm. the, the cherubim, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Um, Brian, did you have a sense that these were people, angels, um, just some kind of a creature? What What was your sense? I did feel that it was some. It was, if I could call them, two people, but mm -hmm. they were they were riding something, and that something is what I was unsure of, uh, even though I didn't see with clarity. And so I, I even wondered to my to myself, you know, could these have been two angels? You know, within the moment I thought about it, but it was it was so quick, and even in pondering it. It's like okay, Lord, well, I, I didn't see this with clarity, but and I've been kind of revisiting in my in my mind, just trying to see it again, see, uh, remember what I was watching. But uh, I guess in a sense, when when I see something like this, I'm thinking, Lord, this is. I almost felt um, how do I say, like Lord, this is such a cool dream, but what are you saying to me? And to me, you know, almost like a feeling of uh, humbled. And so I almost don't want to say, oh, it was two angels, it was the encounter from Ezekiel, you know, because I always mm -hmm. I don't want to elevate myself in my mind like that. Um, but yet I know how gracious the Lord is. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it was two people. I don't know whether it was two okay. angels, but that was my my first uh, thought. Um, but as John was saying, I almost felt like it's a cool experience, a great one, Lord, but I don't really see any message. Like the only thing I was getting was perhaps the Lord's reminder to, hey, you need you you've been um you haven't been consistent with you know sitting still as I was uh for several months. So I felt like that need, like, okay, okay, yes. And I've been getting really busy, you know, work here and whatnot. Yeah. So I've been really sitting myself down to just be still and just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, do whatever you want and just allow him to, to show me what he wants to show me and really practicing that. Um, so I almost felt like that was a reminder. Uh, so I guess that's kind of what I was getting at with the whole energy thing. It reminded me of the meditation the Lord had been uh, telling me that I need to, to learn in order to teach. So I'm like, okay, Lord, I want to teach from experience. So I need to do my part. And so it, it's, a, it's been a long process because it's still so new, but um, again, no, I didn't get any main interpretation from it other than, wow, that was really cool. <laughs> well, let me tell you where my mind wandered to. It was, is this a picture of what's possible for human beings hmm. to experience the kind of power that's available in the heavenly realms as we are um, in the right place with him? Hmm. On something of power, you know, a motorcycle, a horse, those are powerful things that take us places. Very true. Yeah. So it, are the wheels within the wheels available to help propel mankind into discoveries? And in, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think, it's interest, I think it's interesting, the description of how it matches what you were saying. Like it's it's one thing to have an experience. It's another thing to have an experience. Then go back and look at Ezekiel and be like, they described exactly what I saw. You know, if you go to Ezekiel 1 verse 15, now as I looked at the living beings, I saw one wheel on the ground beside the living beings for each of the four of them regarding the appearance of the wheels and their construction. They gleamed like chrysolite or burl or ovaline and the four were made alike. Their appearances were a construction, were a wheel set at a right angle, which is exactly what you said, within a wheel. They were the appearance of the construction of a wheel set at a right angle within a wheel. Whenever they moved, they went in any one of their four directions without turning as they moved. Regarding their rims, they were so high that they were awesome and dreadful, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes all around. Wow. So I think it's interesting because I don't know that Ezekiel 10 had eyes and nose, but it was almost like an energy source, and there was mm -hmm. fire in the middle of it. 
and the cherubim would reach in and grab the fire and give it to the man. And then the man would depart, the man in the white linen, I think is interesting. Um, to me, it, <clears throat> I think there's things that when things are described in scripture, a lot of times we think, maybe, maybe nobody else thinks this way. I think sometimes <laughs> that it's like, oh, you know, it's like, <laughs> wow, this is like some sort of heavenly being angel thing. And maybe it's not, maybe it's just a portable energy source. <laughs> maybe it's something that is a carrier and it looks like the glory of God, or it looks super cool to a man that doesn't have understanding, but they're just describing there's fire in the middle of this, which, you know, my background's nuclear physics. So when you study the composition of the atom and you understand the nucleus and how it forms and the protons and electrons and, you know, all of those things around it, this almost sounds like an atom that has been blown up to a big size that you could view it, which by the way, references another dream. Uh, Bohr, B-O-H-R, when he was praying to understand a model of the atom, has a vision of what's called the Bohr model of the atom, which is what we know, which looks a lot like the picture that you saw. It has the nucleus, it has the spinning electrons around it. He wrote it down, um, he submitted it, and he actually won the Nobel Prize in physics for a dream that he had. Wow. And that became the modern understanding, at least at that time. He was a contemporary of Einstein, I believe. Wow. And, um, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity was given, was actually a question that was posed to him in a dream that he had as a kid. And he tried to work it out for like a decade or more. And when he finally figured it out, it was the answer was the theory of relativity. And so I think it's interesting for me when I read scripture, I always, you know, it's, it's, it seems like, well, the four beings are these like, are they like angels? Well, what if they're just animals? You know, well, it's got this and this and this. Well, that, that's cool. But what if they're not like, you know, I, I think there's a reverence for me anyway. When I read scripture, almost everything that I don't understand is like this supernatural thing. And, you know, the first time we made fire to those that have never seen fire, they thought it was a supernatural thing. And now we know, well, it's just fire. The same thing with electric cars or solar power or whatever. As we begin to understand technology, then the veil is kind of removed and it isn't supernatural. It's just something that's beyond our realm of understanding. And so that's why I say that what you saw um, and the way it's described in Ezekiel 10 reminds me of a portable energy source and, and maybe it's carrying the glory of God, um, but it's talking about the glory departing the temple when the fire and the ashes are sprinkled down in the city and then the Shekinah glory comes out of the temple and into the courtyard. You know, and the reason I wondered that is one of the things that we've seen a lot as we press in is, and again, this, this goes back to if people haven't heard us talk much before, we, we believe dreams come from God. That means all dreams come from God. If you get there, and again, study scripture, look for the demonic dreams, look for the soul dreams. I did. I spent two years doing that. Couldn't find any. Spent two more years interpreting just nightmares, trying to find that one. Okay, well, clearly this one is demonic. Haven't found one. Now in 20 years of doing dreams, not one example of a dream that doesn't come from God. Not one. Unless it was a dream that somebody made up and said, hey, Brian, I had a dream. You give me a million dollars. What do you think? Yeah. You should give me a million. <laughs> like, no, clearly that's a that's what a false dream is. But if you get there, if you can get to that point or even consider the idea that dreams come from God, then you begin to realize that they could be heavenly downloads of technology that we don't understand. And again, yes. case in point, the theory of relativity, the Bohr model of the atom, you know, but if you get there, then you can get to a place of understanding where you can really begin to kind of pull the layers off. And you can be like, wow, I really thought that this was some sort of like a technology thing. And it's not that at all. It may be more like an angelic presence. Or it may be more like a heat source, you know, instead of just automatically going to, well, this has to be some kind of angel, or this has to be a fallen one, or this is a Nephilim or, or whatever, one of the various hierarchies of angels. Maybe it's just something a whole lot simpler than what we think. But one of the things that really intrigues me is times, dates, locations. So if you're looking at an event, it's like, when did you see this event? Where were you in the event? Can, can you tell what part of the earth you were in? Was it daytime or nighttime? Was it summer or, or, or winter? You know, do you know what year it was? And as you begin to ask these questions and put these pieces together, suddenly you can begin to see a context. Now, not always, because sometimes God will literally speak outside of context. It's like the construct in the matrix. It's, it's like standing on a soundstage and there's just all white behind you and underneath you. And it looks like it's just this infinite white in all directions. But if you can get past that and be like, if God is showing you a hotel, it may be that that hotel actually exists and something significant happened there. Mm -hmm. And then you'll find the time, the date, and then the location. And so I'm looking at this and I'm wondering about 
time, date, and location in particular, but I'm also wondering about the description in Ezekiel 10, where it says the glory departs the temple. Yeah. And actually that man was raining judgment down with the coals of fire. So if you relate it to Ezekiel 10, those two could be waiting to release judgment, you know, on somebody, something. Is it possible that you had this encounter that was so like Ezekiel 10? Now, Ezekiel 10 happens before the glory departs the temple because they see the process. They see the cherubim. They see the wheels within wheels. They see the man come up. They see scoops of coals put in his hands, and then he departs, and then they see the glory depart. So is it is it possible, Brian, that your encounter precedes a level of judgment or a very significant event like in Dan, in, like in Ezekiel 10? Do you think that's possible? Well, one, I haven't had not thought of that. So, um, but it, judging by the fact that it happened in May, and uh, if this means anything, uh, it was the morning of the 18th. Um, on a past broadcast I, I had with Diana, I mentioned how the, the enemy himself likes to use the number six and 13 and 18 when they do their evil deeds and whatnot. But I've noticed a few times where the Lord will purposely do something major, the Lord himself, on certain dates, almost as if kind of like an in your face, slap in the face to the enemy. So, um, with this being May, and it happening on the 18th, and what I've heard about uh, June and what the Lord has been sharing from some other prophets of us getting down to the, within the six months of you know November 5th and whatnot, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I guess that's the long answer to your question, <laughs> judging that by the time of how close we are and we're about to step into June, uh, which again, they want to exalt uh, confusion and, and whatnot. Um, but just like the Lord overturned Roe versus Wade in the sixth month, um, wouldn't be surprised if the Lord begins to 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 do things as well, um, being that we're so close. So, yeah, those are my thoughts. <laughs> I, I was. Did you see anything, Diana, along that line? Well, I did because his vision that comes after this, mm. I feel like is related to judgment. Now, you might not feel that way, Brian. You may feel like it was something else. Now, the the vision that yeah. The, if we get to that, that one, yes, I, that's absolutely judgment definitely okay. stood out to me. Um, I didn't make the con didn't make the connection to this encounter specifically, but now it's almost making me wonder about all three of them. Mm -hmm. And if the Lord is talking about a process, mm -hmm. um, and even with regarding energy and whatnot, uh, connecting to the second one to the dream. But I, yeah. I won't say any more yet on that. But well, that stood out to me. That's a really good train of thought there. I, and I believe things that happen on the same night, dreams, mm -hmm. visions, encounters. They are very often connected. They're just a different scene of what's trying to be communicated to you. So the next, the next vision and the dream all happened on the 18th. Yes, and in the, in that order. So encounter, dream, vision. And now that we're all talking, I'm starting to, to feel his presence is rushing, almost like confirming that it's painting a, a whole picture. And it's funny because the wheels that I saw, it seemed like there were three, three wheels, and here we are with three: an encounter, a dream, and a vision. The Lord could have done three dreams. He could have done three visions. I think that's also the Lord's touch. <laughs> um, but wow. Well, I, I think I might know what the event was that your encounter could have been announcing. Okay, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if we should wait till I, because I haven't heard the second vision or the other dream. And when I first, and I got this when you said the date and I'm like, ooh. Okay. And, <laughs> but then I, I felt in my spirit that I should wait. And I didn't okay. know we were going to go here. I didn't know I was going to read Ezekiel 10. I didn't know Ezekiel 10 said the glory departs the temple. I didn't know that we were going to have a conversation about judgment at all. Hmm. But yeah. I think it's interesting, the conversation we just had a little bit ago, where we talked about how almost this exact encounter being up in the air, in the sky, a heavenly being next to it or and or below it are the wheels within wheels. And then there's the scene that plays out that wasn't in your encounter, but was in the glory departs the temple, which is the guy in white linen shows up, the cherub give him coals from the center of the wheels within the wheels. He departs, he sprinkles it on the city, and then the glory departs. Um, do you know what happened the next day? Uh, oh, you mean in my life? <laughs> personally, I mean, or, or... I mean, in the world. In the world. The next no. day, May 19th, mm -hmm. while in the air, in the sky. Mm -hmm. In was a helicopter, that, was that that day? The oh, president my. of Iran and the foreign minister are killed. Whoa! Oh yeah, five nineteen. Wow. Hmm. Yes. 
two beings. Wow. Wow. Well, I can't say that I knew where I was, in case you're going to ask. <laughs> Location, I didn't know where I was. <laughs> um, I just think it's interesting, too, because out of all the ways that somebody could die, being in something that literally hovers high up in the air is fascinating. Hmm. Wow. And did I hear right that it was a failed hel uh, because of the technology being so old? Is that what you you heard as well? You know, I don't I don't know that I can trust much of anything that I hear. Yeah. But I I have heard comments on I, I think it was a Russian helicopter. I've heard that I've you know of course there's all kinds of theories of who might have been involved and what happened yeah. and this after the bombings of Israel and blah blah blah. I think there's a lot of speculation. I don't know that there's much proof, but to me it would be more dramatic if there wasn't a third party actor involved in taking down the helicopter, which I think is, a, I, I don't have any proof one way or another that it was or it wasn't, but if it mm -hmm. wasn't, then it more closely mirrors what we would consider in the category of an act of God mm -hmm. than an act of a opposing state or group. Wow. So again, I don't know. Um, you always wonder with helicopter accidents, you know, it's like Kobe Bryant, you know, you're just like, it was what happened? Like, did that fail? Did somebody throw a rock, fire a weapon? Yeah. Like, yeah. was that designed to fail? Was that supposed to happen? Was that, an, was, was that an act of God? But I think in particular, helicopters, in light of the setting of where you were up in the air, hundreds, but not thousands of feet. <laughs> you specifically said these at the beginning. True. I was high up, but it wasn't 20 or 40 feet. It was hundreds of feet, but it wasn't thousands of feet. So an airplane, it's 30,000 feet. You know, a helicopter... They're not 30,000 feet up in the air. Yeah. They're hundreds sure. of feet up in the air. No. And so I just, I, I don't know. It's a question in my spirit is, is this related? And then of course the next question would be, why did the, why did you have this encounter? And again, when we look at dreams and or encounters as intelligence, a lot of times I, I feel like we have a very human mindset, especially when bad things happen. When people pass away, I always want to look at what could we have prevented it? If we would have known names, helicopter, where they were leaving, could we have sent a message to somebody and saved somebody's life? Um, but then really quickly, when you're working with God, you find that that's not necessarily his thought. It may be already predetermined that something is going to happen. And he wants to let you know or build a memorial in your life where you can look back. I've actually done a video on this where we talked about people who had some level of a dream or premonition of 9-11 before it happened. Uh -huh. And I was one of them. I actually wrote it down in a college paper about wow. them successfully toppling both towers. Wow. You know? and, and, and yeah, when I saw that after being a rescue worker at Ground Zero after 9-11, I found that like months later when I was, I had started to write a book about my experiences and I started looking through old files on my computer and I saw this paper from college and like the hair on the back of my wow. neck like stood up. I even said, hello, America, this is your wake up call. You know, and I was comparing the Oklahoma City bombing, which was a truck bombing, to the 93 World Trade Center bombing, which was also a truck bombing. But I talked about them successfully toppling both towers, and my conclusions were, comparing two truck bombings, was that we needed better airline security. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how that was a thought in my head, but everything that I suggested in the paper is, is a course of action that we took immediately after 9-11, and, you know, only ticketed ID passengers go to gates. We should have plastic bomb sniffing machines that can sniff luggage which we do, and we should have, um, we should be able to have better x-ray equipment and or explosive detection on people's person when they go through security. And my college professor kind of patted me on the head and said, well, that's cute. That'll never happen in America. Families will always go to the gates and say goodbye to, we don't even remember what that was like when mm -hmm. your family would take you to the gate and watch you yeah. get on. Like that's, that hasn't been the case in 20 something odd years. Most, yeah. a lot of people that travel today never saw their family mm -hmm. saying goodbye or picking them up right at the gate as soon as yeah. they get on the plane. It's just yeah. not done anymore, anywhere that I know of. But wow. so sometimes God will show us things that are going to happen that either he's already determined are going to happen. And, and this gets into, can a dream be changed? You know, and, and that depends on the purpose of the dream. Dreams are the language of God. So if God is telling you some information, but he's not giving you a warning so you can prevent it, then no, it can't be changed because you weren't given enough information to know that this could have been talking about how the geopolitics of the Middle East were going to radically shift the very next day. And you may be now getting that revelation for the first time, which is why we unpack this stuff and we talk about it. But then it's like, 
why did he show you that? Was it, is it that, and then you go back to Ezekiel 10. Why was Ezekiel there? Why did he see that whole thing unfold? Why did he talk about a wheel at a right angle within another wheel, just like you saw? <laughs> did God give him that encounter knowing thousands of years later, we were going to have this conversation and he was going to give you an encounter that would confirm your encounter? Yeah. And most of us don't think that way. We think of, well, yeah. God is showing us what happened in Bible times. Maybe God was showing them how he was going to announce the geopolitical shift in the Middle East in our day. Maybe Ezekiel, when this gets really heady, when you think about it, yeah. maybe Ezekiel was describing a level of confirmation that's buried into scripture. So now when you have this encounter, you could understand. And a lot of times we're like, well, no, it's not about me. It's, you know, I mean, Ezekiel, he was a prophet and none of those guys, they were just regular people like we were. Yeah. None of them thought that they, we were going to be talking about them thousands of years later and that they were going to yeah. be the heroes of the faith. And, and so they might be leaning in even in the cloud of witnesses, listening to this very conversation and being like, wow, that's really cool. I had an experience like he had, and you're sitting there thinking I had an experience like he had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John Paul Jackson once um, had an amazing encounter. And when he got back, he, you know, God, why did you do that? And God said, I never do anything without a witness. So Brian, you might've been a witness to something that he's about to unleash. I was going to mention that very same thing. So I'm glad you did. But when wow. I heard John, John say, because um, yeah. I've heard him say that and, and someone else say as well, you know, Lord, why did you show me this? And uh, I, I can't remember who, who said it, uh, but they said, well, God loves to just share things with, for no reason at all at times. It might make zero sense to you, but because um, he considers you his friend or mm -hmm. considers you, you, you've uh, shown yourself faithful in a certain area, you know, certain believers or whatnot, he just wants to, to, sh to show you. He wants to show off, I guess I could say, in a, in a yeah. way. That may not be all the time all, in all, every case, mm -hmm. um, but even if, John, you're saying, you know, could have been, could this have happened because of Ezekiel and Ezekiel because of this, et cetera. Sometimes I feel like they all of the above because when the Lord does something, he's already thinking of this, of uh, what you could call the matrix or how it all will connect to future generations and, and whatnot. And it's just, as you said, it gets heady. I like how you said that. It's just like, whoa. <laughs> and then you just have that much more awe and wonder uh, and appreciation for God and what he shows yes. and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah. amazing. Well, let's move on to dream two, because otherwise we're going to be here all night, even though this is exciting. Some <laughs> people might not have hours to listen to all this. Although to me, it is very fascinating to see yeah. how God is working with his people.